And then we found that having looked at, because these 30 of us scored all um, descriptors, we found that just three items, vascular pattern, bleeding, erosions and ulcerations with different levels in the lymph nerve scale, actually accounted for over 80% of the uh, variance between observes. Hey, this was, we were, seemed to be onto something here because if rather than having 10 or 11 different descriptors, we ditched one of the descriptors, but um, 10 different descriptors, we could reduce it to three. That actually became quite practicable. And you can see that if you look here at the ability for, the, um, for, this, for these three descriptors at the different levels to uh, predict what actually happened to on the, the, the uh, reported, so you've got predicted VAS there, reported VAS up on the y-axis, and you can see that actually it's a fairly tight fit, and furthermore, thank goodness, it covered really the full range of anticipated severity. So that seemed to be that we were onto something, but clearly we needed to, to, to validate that. So that's where the third phase came in. So we took another 25 investigators, again from the States and, uh, and, and Europe. This time we were a bit more selective. We needed to go through some training for the three different descriptors and we wanted them to, 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 to show that, they, they, uh, that there was uh, agreement based on uh, previously scored videos. And then we took yet another cohort of videos from, this, for, from these uh, two studies and over a range of severity is assigned in, in, in the study, and again with additional videos of normal and severe, quite a complex process. And each evaluated a, a, um, a set, and we gave that, rather than giving them all in one, we, we spaced it out so there wasn't a monster session. And then we were looked at symptoms as well. And they, um, they were given anchor points, they had their visual analog scale, and we... Uh, uh, validated this score. And these are just sort of three slides of what there were. So the vascular pattern with three levels of sorry, normal is clearly normal, but the definitions are really important uh, to my mind because those are what we were agreeing. Patchy vascular pattern, uh, patchy loss of uh, or blurring, and the complete loss. These actually are, are video clips rather than just still photographs, which either look a bit odd. Um, and uh, the um, uh, and the uh, for bleeding, because bleeding, there was, uh, there was none, of course, it was normal, mucosal, luminal, or, 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 or uh, um, severe, again, with explicit decisions. Um, the erosions and ulcers, which is the third domain, again, with, with four different uh, levels, no ulcers, then erosions, which were very precisely defined as less than five millimeters uh, a, a, a break in the mucosa, superficial ulcers, or, 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 or deep ulcers. And we, you can't see this, and I'm so sorry, I need to get this um, redrawn, I suspect. But um, you can see that of all the videos we had, and the VAS up to 100 there, that they really did cover the full range from zero to, to, to actually to 97 as it happened. So you are covering the full range of severity. And we had a step up. In the in the in the kappa. So here's the inter-observer variation for those different descriptors. And you're here with kappas up at the naught uh, at point, higher 0.7s high, uh, and the uh, 0.8s. For the intra-observer variation, again much higher. What happens to bleeding? I don't know. Well, you've got a much lower intra, but within the same observer uh, record of bleeding. And then, if you look between phase two and phase three, so this is phase three. You can see for these three components, hey, look down there. So if you tot up the individual scores, you're accounting for 91% of the variance just by simply adding. And that's what I like because actually. Coming back to the Oxford Index Predictive Factors, and I said about simplicity, you don't need any mathematical transformation uh, of this. You just need to add up the different levels, and that actually, that is then the UCIS score, which um, together um, uh, um, uh, um, accounts for the vast majority of the variation between observers. What we've not yet done is to set thresholds, and we might um, uh, debate that. What's interesting, too, is that when we looked at symptom knowledge with and without symptom knowledge, actually, if you look at the cappers without symptom knowledge, because all of these were done without, you know, if endoscopy scoring in clinical trials stands for anything, then it's got to sound for something different from just measuring symptoms. Otherwise, what's the point of doing endoscopy? Um, and, uh, in fact, the... Um, 
there is, um, with or without symptom knowledge, have very little impact, which suggests that it's doing um, uh, something uh, different. And so the UCIS is uh, internally consistent. I've not gone into Cronbach's alpha, that wonderful um, term, which is a, 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 a statistical measure of internal consistency. Um, it's got good um, test-retest reliability because the good correlation uh, coefficients, I haven't actually shown you those data, but that's the, the, um, the, the except the overall figure of 0.91 uh, coefficients suggesting it accounts for 91% of the variations. Good intra-observer uh, um, uh, um, reliability and good intra-observer reliability. And because the symptom knowledge only had a modest effect, suggests that um, it's doing something independent. Clearly, we need to set thresholds, and we've gone one step to that, but we haven't validated, which is why I'm not presenting it. But, um, um, but it is ready for use, and we're developing it as a, 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 as a training tool. And I think, so if you've got somebody where you look at the UCIS and you score um, 11, as this is just the, the, the side of it. So you've got, uh, you can imagine a patient with complete loss of vascular pattern who's got frank blood in the lumen and a D pulse, and much like that background to the initial title slide I showed, who's one of the videos there because he came to collect to me six hours after I'd taken that, 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 uh, uh, those pictures. Then, the, um, then they've got a score of 11, and that's about as severe. As, as you can get. So this, I think, is, um, uh, I hope will be, be uh, um, uh, uh, rolled out and uh, whether we can get that into endoscopic programs clearly something we're working on. Couldn't, of course, done this without a, a huge amount of help, not only from my colleagues and co-authors, but from people around the world. Actually, as it happened, um, nobody from, uh, uh, from Michigan in phase two or uh, phase three, but the whole range of uh, European central and actually one or two Eastern uh, uh, European um, uh, countries. And with that, I'll take questions and hope you'll all come to ECHO next year in Barcelona. Thank you very much indeed. So can I ask that question, <laughs> which is a very pertinent question. So which do you choose? I think both work. The reason for making that statement and, um, uh, is that um, it really worries me that patients who are really sick, that if you give them infliximab and then it doesn't work and they come to collect me, having infliximab circulating around, they may get, if they have a septic complication, which 25% of people do after emergent collect me, and you've got infliximab, you really get very, very anxious indeed. Whereas in those circumstances, you've got cyclops 1, you stop it and it gets out of the system and we publish data suggesting the cyclops 1 doesn't alter the post-infective complications. So I think that's one of the questions which came up, which is still arises from the CISIF study. And we touched on this um, uh, uh, yesterday when Ellen was, was uh, presenting some of the data from the, the, the abstract, is that I think one of the unanswered questions is what actually do the complication rates of those who do come to emergency colectomy? Because I think it's a critical one. And whilst mm -hmm. I'm very co quite confident with infliximab or anti-TNF therapy, if people come to elective surgery, I'm much less uh, confident, of because I don't think we have any data yet, on if they come to emergency clinic. So that's where I come from, because in fact, in Oxford at the moment, it's very simple as to which I choose. Um, I toss a coin because they're part of the construct study and one-to-one -one randomization. So I, 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 I duck the decision that way. But that's where I come from. Um, but, you know, people will differ in their, in their evaluation. Go on. And, and if they're already on azathioprine? So I think there's a, that's, a, that's a good question and a good point. If they're already on azathioprine, where are you going to go with cyclops 1? I entirely accept that. Then that will push you to, 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 to using mm. infliximab. I accept that. I, I'm pretty qualified because if you look at the outcomes, you know, it ain't the holy grail. You've still got um, um, at least half who come to collect me in the long-term follow-up of the honor. So, so, so I think that um, I, I, I accept that. And that's really putting a decision in context. And, and I think that's an important issue. Alan. Uh, 